Good evening, friends. Uh, I'm Jonathan Gray. I've been involved in archaeological work for quite some time, and have we got some exciting things to share with you? We're going to start with Noah's Ark tonight. We pulled into the uh, Kurdish town of Debizet about uh, dark and checked into the Erzurum Hotel here on the right, and then I went across the road to uh, buy some food. There was a little supermarket sign immediately across the road, although uh, I must say the uh, supermarket itself was probably no bigger than a bathroom. And as I approached the uh, side of the uh, shop, I noticed one, two, three bullet holes right there in the shop window. So I decided we did not need to buy food that night. So uh, we went back to the hotel. The street emptied very, very fast. And about midnight, my uh, teammate in the room up near the top of the hotel, Trevor, called out, Jonathan, Jonathan, wake up, wake up. And uh, I listened, there was the sound of uh, dogs barking, something fell in the street, and the boom, 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 boom of Turkish artillery continued for hours. There was the occasional pop, which was probably the uh, return fire from the outnumbered Kurds, and by morning when we went out of the hotel, we discovered that 13 civilians had died within 100 metres of the hotel during the night. Now, the reason we were here, and by the way, we are right across here at the very extreme end of Turkey, uh, over here in the Mount Ararat area. Debiazit is the base camp for Noah's Ark expeditions. This uh, town uh, was the base for our work at this time also. And uh, the whole thing started way back in 1959. At that time, a Turkish airline pilot was uh, taking stereo photographs, and these photographs were sent to Dr. Brandenberger of Ohio State University. He was a world expert on photogametry. And by the way, uh, Dr. Brandenberger is the same man who had discovered the Cuban missiles facing America in the Kennedy era. When Brandenburg saw this photo, he said, I have never seen anything like this before. Here is a massive ship in the mountains. He carefully studied the photograph and the news soon got out. An American expedition party went there and they spent a day and a half at the site. Somebody said, let's blast a hole in the side and see what comes out. Real good archaeological uh, method. Well, they did so, and out came timber-shaped pieces of stone, according to one member of the party. Of course, wood could not petrify in, in just a few thousand years, could it? The verdict was nothing of archaeological interest. Seventeen ye long years went by, and uh, then a man called Ronald Wyatt, he was an American biblical archaeologist, took an interest in the site. Nothing had happened all this time. It had been totally rejected. Then Ron began to do some scientific tests. Ron actually was a man uh, who believed the Bible implicitly, but when he came to this site, he said, this is too big for me. It's longer than a football field. It's as large as a medium-sized battleship. Ron went back home and he said to some of his friends, look, we have to pray for a miracle. If this is Noah's Ark, and we're not sure whether it is, but if this is the big boat in the mountains that is long spoken of in ancient legend and in the scripture, let's pray for an earthquake so that we can excavate it. The earthquake may, be, uh, may bring it out of the ground or it may fall away, the, the earth may fall away. So they prayed for several months, these Christian friends who believed in prayer. And then on November the 25th, 1978, at 3 minutes to 11, an earthquake lifted this structure completely out of the ground to a distance of 20 feet or 6 meters. Now, the earth they probably dropped away from it. This is what we believe. Nobody was killed. The villagers were no strangers to earthquakes, but this one they considered abnormal. It was preceded by the sky turning silver. S the people who were in that village went out into the, the, the streets 
They were all outside, nobody was killed, and the earthquake was described as not normal, a miracle. People in the nearby village looked upon this as a bad omen and they got up and left, 20 of them. Well, friends, there it is, before and after. The picture on the right is before the earthquake. You see it in the ground and here is afterwards. Following extensive testing at the site, Ron Wyatt began to suggest at last that this possibly was Noah's Ark. But the skeptics came out, oh no, this thing has to be a freak of nature. Get real, what else could it be at 6,300 feet or 2,000 metres altitude? And then there were those who said, well look, there's not enough water to produce a worldwide flood, surely. And uh, they uh, kept poo-hooing it. Well, friends, let's see. We do have 90% of Earth's surface covered by water. And there's 18 times more water below sea level than there is land above it. It's a well-known fact that most of Earth's mountains are of recent formation. And if seabeds can rise, and if continents can sink, there'd be heaps of water for a worldwide flood. Now the old traditions tell us that before the great disaster, a survival vessel was built and that representatives of all land animals were taken on board. But you say, how could all those animals squeeze in? Well, this is a picture similar to what I, what I found in a friend's uh, little girl's storybook where even the giraffe had to put his head out of the, uh, and the wind, even the elephant and the giraffe had to put his head out to relieve the pressure. Now, I don't think that Noah's Ark was anything like that. The truth is the Ark of the Bible was enormous, longer than a football field, three, I'm sorry, uh, I should say 32,000 tonnes, and room enough inside for 494 double-decker buses. Now there is a man called Ernst Meyer, probably the leading American taxonomist. He says that there are one million animal species, that 60,000 of these are sea animals, 70% of the remainder are insects, and that you have about 20 thousand species of land animals. This includes birds, amphibians, reptiles and uh, of course mammals. Now if we were to place all of these two by two into the ark you would only be occupying 41 percent of the space. So I suppose the question really is not how did Noah fit all these into the boat but what did he do with all that extra space? Certainly there was enough room for all those animals on the boat. Now concerning the great flood, this was no gentle rising of water. When the cosmic disaster struck, the earth was tipped on its axis, tremendous friction resulted under the earth, cracks opened up and fire and water burst out. And in the explosion, volcanic ash and hot water was blown high into the sky. The protective vapour canopy around the planet began to collapse upon the earth. It poured down in such volume and force, the result was disastrous. Huge tidal waves swept from pole to pole. Land masses and seas were churned up together. Did you know, friends, that on every continent and in numerous places are vast fossil graveyards where creatures have been swept to death in their millions? Land creatures and creatures of the deep sea, mixed and buried together in a completely unnatural way. And fossils of countless animals have been found buried in a swimming position. We have complete islands and mountains, hundreds of feet high from the Arctic Circle down to tropical Burma, completely, completely composed of animal bones that have been washed together in some great disaster. And on tall, isolated hills, 
hundreds of thousands of hills worldwide are bone-filled chasms. Human artifacts are mixed in with some of these. There was mass extinction, friends, in all parts of the world simultaneously and sudden burial. You go across to the northern parts of the uh, northern hemisphere, across Siberia and Alaska, millions of remains of tropical mammoths, a, a large type of elephant, are found embedded in frozen water-laid muck. And uh, these mammoths, by the way, some of them have been found in perfect condition. The flesh is still good enough, enough to eat. Uh, flesh that uh, shows uh, it was instantly buried, instantly frozen, snap frozen, before anything could decay. As a matter of fact, on the tongues of some of these animals have been found buttercups. They were feeding and they were buried and frozen quickly before they could decay. And uh, in their stomachs, pine cones have been found. You can wander along some of the beaches of northern Siberia and it is like walking along in front of shop windows where you will see sometimes mammoths emerging in the uh, sides of the cliff and bones lying all over the beach where the, the erosion is now coming and uh, bringing them out. Predators are found today frozen in mid-motion all over the world still swallowing their prey as for example this perch in the act of swallowing a herring this was found in Wyoming, United States. And friends, millions of fossils perfectly preserved testify of sudden death and sudden burial worldwide. Water laid death. We have all over the world things we're not told about. Tree trunks penetrating through several seams of coal as uh, in this one in France. Here is a most crucial fact how did these trees stand on end for millions of years while waiting to be buried if these layers are millions of years old? No, friends, each of these layers was rapidly laid down by moving water. Water covered the earth. And as the water continued to uh, remake the surface of the earth, eventually the time came as the ocean basins were expanding in this great disaster that the water ran off, leaving behind these high water marks which you see all around the world. Evidence that they have not been there uh, over millions of years because the erosion has not taken place. They're still there. They are no more than a few thousand years old. Evidence of a falling water level off the continents as the water eventually drained back into the seas. Now, the boat landed up in the mountains. The survivors gazed upon a totally different world. Barren wastes, bleak and sterile hills, and extreme hot and cold. New mountain ranges were still being thrust up. The Great Flood was left in the memory of its survivors and as they, these people fanned out, this became the most universal memory of mankind. We have over 600 different legends worldwide of this great worldwide flood that destroyed a world and a handful of survivors survived. For more than 2,000 years, there were reports among historians from Egypt down up to Greece to Mesopotamia that pilgrims used to visit the remains of the ark. And some of them would take amulets and uh, make lucky charms from parts of the ark's remains. Then around 800 BC, the uh, Assyrians recorded a visit to the ark in which they had to go down three stories into the ground. When I heard that Ron Wyatt had found Noah's Ark buried in the mud, I was very, very sceptical. For years, friends, I had followed the stories of men climbing up big Mount Ararat and uh, my belief grew that the Ark lay partly hidden in ice in a canyon on that mountain. However, none of these stories had been authenticated. Alleged photographs had either been lost 
or were inconclusive, there was no hard evidence. I did not want to believe that this thing found by this man under mud on a hillside was Noah's Ark. I, I was very, very sceptical about the whole matter. And then I read an article in a Christian magazine uh, which was ridiculing Ron and that made me firmer than ever in my opposition against him. But I, however, I did decide that I would put my money where my mouth was. So I flew across the United States and I decided that I would confront this man with these questions. And I hurled up all my objections against him. But it was I who was mistaken. I must now confess publicly that I was wrong. The solid evidence was there and my arguments one by one evaporated. So I joined the team. On the slopes of the Ararat Mountains, Ron found some big stone objects with holes through them. These were similar to ancient sea anchors found on the seabed near shipwrecks around the world. These, by the way, were essential equipment for ancient shipping. They were called more appropriately drogue stones. With their flat surface, they created a drag in turbulent water to prevent a ship from uh, slipping sideways against the wave and being capsized. Of course, in calmer waters, they'd just hang, hang right down in the deep, sounding for the bottom. And uh, they could have been manipulated also to direct a vessel around an obstruction. Now, these drogue stones in the Turkish mountains were much bigger. They were of the size that you would uh, expect to belong to a boat as large as the Ark. There was a hole through each one of them and you'll notice that the holes have an inner diameter which is larger than the outer. The knot in the centre would swell and hold tight, thus present, uh, preventing the, uh, the rope from moving and chafing. Of course, the sceptics tried to explain these as Armenian tombstones. Friends, here we have a shipwreck with more of these stones. We have a Turkish diver here on the, the bed of the Mediterranean Sea. You try telling this Turkish diver that what he's found are just Armenian tombstones and that, that holes were, those holes there in the stones were simply for candles. Well, my objections kept uh, flowing through to Ron and I said, but this boat shape in the mountains, it's not a boat. Ron, the streamlined shape is caused by lava flowing around an obstruction. Well, there's the shape. You notice that uh, this is a pointing uphill. The answer came, what you need, Jonathan, is an understanding of fluid dynamics. Now here are two pictures. One of the boat shape up in the Turkish mountains and one of a totally different shape. If this shape on the left was formed naturally, the mud flow would hit the obstruction and pile up behind it like a light bulb shape and then it would move outward and possibly meet lower down and the lower down portion would be where the sharp end was something something like this so it would come out here would flow down and form its point downwards but you notice the point is upwards here this is not the way it happens in nature this is the way nature does it this is man-made, this is nature-made. So Jonathan, learn about fluid dynamics, Ron said, and you'll realise that this could only be a man-made object. Well, my objection was shot down. The scientists continued to come and uh, they brought three different types of metal detector over several years. They found a pattern of iron at regular intervals each time. The pattern found by the metal detectors was recorded by laying yellow and pink tape along the lines of pattern. You'll notice that the object is impaled here on a big rock. You'll notice that the straight lines are bent, much the same as a, a car accident against, uh, wrapped around a, a lamp pole. These two objects, the boat shape and this rock, do not belong together. These collided at some time and hence a damage on the side. This is a foreign body. This must have come from somewhere else. We'll show you what we believe happened a little later in the, in the program. 
Now since the boat shape came up from the mud, the weather has been eroding the mud and uh, vertical uprights resembling a ship's ribs have been appearing more prominently along the sides. And after a section of the mud was uh, shaved off, vertical petrified ribs began to show as a different colour. And deeper still, horizontal lines showed up. And uh, these indicate a lattice pattern. Subsequent radar scans of the full length of the structure were made, lengthwise, crosswise and laterally along the sides. The ground penetrating radar picked up a definite pattern and uh, as we looked the radar showed with refined detail the same pattern picked up by the metal detectors and what the radar showed was stunning. It revealed walls, cavities, a door near the front in the south end, ramps, and near the door, two large round tank structures, 14 feet high and 24 feet across with metal bands around them. Friends, we now have 1,000 feet, that's 300 metres of paper printout from the radar scans. When the information was fed into a computer, it gave this shape under the ground. The vessel is in a state of petrification and collapse. I say that with regret. It appears that what we have here is the remains of the hull and the bottom deck. The two top decks have collapsed and what we appear to have is their rubble lying on top of the bottom deck. There seems to be a pattern to this rubble. As you walk along the structure between the two walls, you'll notice it rises in a step here and along here comes down in a step here and another step here and goes straight again. The computer visualises from this the original shape of the structure. Quite modern looking, is it not? Bob Morrill, a member of our team, has constructed a model based upon the radar scans. There are 72 ribs along one side and 72 ribs along the other side facing each other exactly, based upon the radar scans. 72 and 72, 144, a good biblical number. And there is the doorway, which is about eight feet across. The door has gone, but the, the cavity is there, about uh, two and a half metres wide. Friends, also we have uh, uh, a few more pictures here of Bob Murrell's uh, model, drawn up from the radar scans. There are four protrusions which appear to be at the back here. Uh, people have suggested to us they might be stabilizers. The boat did not have to travel anywhere. All it had to do was ride out a number of months of the most turbulent storms this world has ever seen, when seas and continents were churned up together. Now you'll notice here in the model that the, uh, uh, the doorway is in the front here. This is where the uh, radar shows it to be. That's the doorway. So it's a ship. Well you might ask could it be a Roman galleon, perhaps a Viking ship? It's a question that I'm asked from time to time. Well let's see. You'll notice that our boat is in a continental heartland location several hundred kilometres from the nearest Mediterranean Sea. Uh, for it to get there, this land would all have to be underwater. Now, in historical times, this has always been land. It has not been underwater. So I suggest to you, friends, that instead of somebody inventing a boat that we're never told about in history, let's admit that the ancient world did record a ship in this area. And that ship is the legendary Noah's Ark at a time when the waters did cover the land. Now compare the size. Here is the size of Noah's Ark as given in the Bible. 300 cubits, we're told. Now if Moses, the compiler of this account, was raised and educated in Egypt, he would undoubtedly be using the Egyptian cubit to describe it. The royal Egyptian cubit was 20.6 inches, just over half a metre. 
Now, we know that later cubits were used, and sometimes people say, well, is the cubit the distance from the elbow to the hand? Or is it perhaps the 18-inch Hebrew cubit? Well, we know, friends, that the royal Egyptian cubit was the one used by the Hebrews at least until the time of King Solomon. Our team was in Jerusalem recently, and we measured some tombs from the time of Solomon. They were cut according to the 20.6-inch cubit. The 18-inch cubit did not come into use until much later. Well, while we're here in Jerusalem, let's just have a look at, at some of the scenery here. Here's a, a dear little Arab boy that was selling bagels on his lovely sweaty arm one afternoon, selling them off one by one to people who wanted to take them home to eat. Dear little fellow. So 300 cubits equals 515 feet or 158.46 metres. The critics have said that boat shape in Turkey is roughly the size of Noah's Ark. This is actually a, a sketch based upon radar scanning. You'll notice there's the rock intrusion here. Uh, you'll notice a passageway. There's, there's nine divisions plus the, the uh, pattern of metal as well. Now, they say it's roughly the length of Noah's Ark. Roughly? That won't fly, friends. It's exactly 300 cubits in length. Careful measurements were made by two different groups to show its inside length to be. One group went one year and they measured it at 515.7 feet. Another team went the next year and measured it at exactly 515 feet to the last inch. 6,180 inches. I'll tell you, friends, that's not rough. That's very precise. The length of Noah's Ark and the length of that structure are identical. And the average beam width is right too. And I'd say, friends, if I was still a sceptic, for one to quibble away such a coincidence as a boat shape upon the mountains of Ararat, 300 cubits, in width and with an average 50 foot cubit, a 50 cubit width, and ascribe it to a chance would be to drive scepticism beyond the limits. Now another test is the place names in the area. Now this is an interesting one. Archaeologists know that ancient place names are among the most imperishable of human things. Lost cities have been located by heating ancient place names when they're unchanged for thousands of years. Place names often record events that happened in the locality. This is a very scientific approach. Let's use it here. We're told that toward the end of the flood in the scriptures, Noah sent out a dove and a raven or a crow to test for the re-emergence of land. At first, with nowhere to stand, the crow kept returning. Finally, it did not return. Here is an aerial photograph of the area. Here's our boat. Each of these dots represents a place name connected with Noah's Ark and the people who came out of it. Two kilometres away from the boat shape, eastward, there is a village. This village has a name, Karg Akonwaz, which means the crow will not stand or return. Now notice this map. Here's Big Mount Ararat. Here is our boat. Here we have the mountains of Ararat. We are here about 19 kilometres south of the big mountain. Notice the place names. Here is a, a place called the Valley of Eight. Here is a village called the Place of Eight. And the village people say they don't know where the name came from. It's been there for thousands of years. Now, how many people, according to the scripture, were on Noah's Ark? There were eight people. Now notice this one, Deronic. And the name translated into English means where the oars were reversed. Now, friends, I don't believe that Noah's Ark had oars, but this is a simplistic way of saying where the boat slowed down. You actually have a, a boat that uses oars and you reverse the oars, you're slowing down the boat. So what we're having here is a story told us by the place name that something happened here where a boat slowed down. Now here is the spot. It's 6,000 feet above sea level. And here the name says this is where the boat slowed down. 
Are we talking about a boat going over the mountains here? When water covered these mountains and the boat slowed down? Did you know that the ancient civilizations tell us where to find Noah's Ark? Here are the clues. Notice. On the left hand side we have the clues. On the right hand side we have what we have found. Number one. The Bible tells us that the ark landed in the Ararat region. Number two, it landed on the mountains, mountains plural. Three, ancient traditions tell us that it landed on a, that it's now to be found on a hill, not a tall mountain. Four, in the Quran, we are told that the name of that hill is Al Judi. Now, the Quran, of course, was written by Muhammad, who was a descendant of Abraham. And uh, although the, the Muslims are, are not uh, Christians, they still believe in the flood. They uh, have ancestors who survived it, just as we do. Now, we have found that our boat shape is in the Ararat region. Secondly, it's on a mountain range, which would be compatible with on the mountains of Ararat. It is on a hill, not a tall mountain. And the name of this hill on maps for many years has been Al Judi. The Turkish maps have it as Al Kudi, very, very similar. It was stated to be on the hill's west side. Indeed, our object is on the hill's west side. The old traditions held that the ark was alongside a large rock. Interestingly, this present object is alongside a large rock and impaled on it as well. If this were the ark of which the Muslims spoke, then it had since been pushed sideways onto the rock by the alluvial mud flow that slid down to the east of it, resulting in the ark's being almost completely covered. Point seven. The Assyrian king Ashurnazapal II, and this king reigned uh, between 883 to 859 BC, claimed that the ark's resting place was Nisur, Friends, less than 500 metres from this present object was a village now called Yuzanjili, and under it, according to older maps, lay Sar, or Nasar, or Nisur. Point eight. The ark was reported to be on a north-south axis. Our boat, likewise, is orientated just 10 degrees from north-south. Now, another point is you go down into it according to the old Assyrians. Friends, it was buried in the ground until November 1978. Then, of course, there's the size, the precise length, and the precise width. Do some of the remains of Noah's Ark lie under the mud? Well, we have scraped away some of the mud already, but the final word will come when the excavation takes place. Now, friends, the question will arise, is there any artifactual evidence? Let's have a look at this. The governor of Ari had Ron demonstrate the radar. When he found what looked like a broken timber near the surface, the governor had it dug up and gave it to Ron to be verified. The lab test revealed organic carbon. It was petrified wood. But the final proof was when it was sectioned. The evidence was obvious. Not only could the internal wood structure be seen, it was also clearly laminated wood. Three separate layers could be seen. The adhesive material or glue had seeped out and hardened on one end and was perfectly aligned with the internal layers but the ultimate test as to whether this was indeed once wood was to determine the presence of organic carbon. Galbraith Labs took samples of the timber. They first analyzed for total carbon content, both organic and inorganic combined. The next test was for only inorganic carbon. By comparing the two results, we would know if organic carbon were present. 
we're in the process of weighing the sample now before the analysis for the total carbon of this sample. The inorganic carbon will be included in this determination. All the carbon that's present, as we run the inorganic carbon, we'll be able to tell the difference if there's any organic present in the material. Okay, 0.71% total carbon in this. 0.71. Inorganic carbon equaled 81 ppm's or parts per million. This equals 0.0081%. The result, 0.71% total carbon less 0.0081% inorganic carbon leaves 0.7019 organic carbon. This indeed shows that this specimen did once consist of living matter. Another exciting evidence came in June of 1991. In the presence of 26 witnesses, Ron found a fossilized rivet. On our last trip out there this past June, we found this very impressive rivet. And if you'll notice here, the plate itself is just a little more than a quarter of an inch in thickness. It's approximately three and a half inches in diameter, the plate itself, and then the shaft of the rivet is a roughly an inch to an inch and a quarter in diameter. And if you'll notice here, it was struck while it was hot and flared out the end of the shaft so that it would not slide back through the hole in this washer. And this uh, shows that their abilities to use metal uh, was quite advanced, uh, quite sophisticated. And folks, there are thousands of these rivets on this boat. In fact, at every joint where the wooden structures are held together. They're held together by large metal plates, which are predominantly iron, and then these rivets. Aluminum, iron, titanium, and other metals present sufficient evidence of a most sophisticated alloy. There are other specimens which also are consistent with what we would expect to find on Noah's Ark. One is a petrified section of a broken antler. Greg Brewer of Dixon, Tennessee found this embedded in the ark in August of 1989. Since it consists of the base of the antler, it can be positively identified by visual inspection. As antlered animals shed these antlers once a year, this shows that at some point in time, an animal with antlers lost them on the ark. There is also a large quantity of coprolites in the areas where the ark has deteriorated and broken away. These are, simply put, petrified animal droppings. Many of the evidences alone are convincing, such as the length the petrified deck timber of laminated wood is the only specimen found to date of its type anywhere on this planet. Never has hand-hewn petrified wood been found, much less laminated. And the list goes on even beyond what we've examined here. But all of the evidences combined are overwhelming. We're delighted with the results, and at this point in time, personally, I can look anybody in the eye and say that this boat-shaped formation in eastern Turkey is actually the remains of Noah's Ark. Friends, the Turkish government reportedly sent a uh, archaeological team to the site, and they uh, recovered four intact metal rods. 
about four feet long, say about 120 centimetres long. These are now in the custody of the uh, Ministry of Mines and Minerals. So you see, even before we get inside the boat, much is already being pushed out. As the mud comes over the top, it pushes down into some of the, the broken uh, timber, into the rooms, and pushes out again items from the side where the rock has in, intruded. So we're getting a little foretaste of what may be found when excavation takes place later. Now there's a question that inevitably arises, and that is, but there couldn't be iron in a boat that old, surely? Well, friends, I suggest you get hold of a copy of my book, Dead Men's Secrets. Uh, over 12 years of research in 30 countries produced some startling evidence. The truth is that long before the so-called Iron Age, human technology was incredibly advanced. Not only iron, but even aluminium was in use. We have solid evidence of this. The history of the past now needs to be rewritten. From the ocean floor, from under the desert sands, and from vine-choked buildings in the jungles, a thousand forgotten secrets are coming to light. The Turks have built a visitor's center for the expected tourist boom, which they hope for when the war is over. This war is a real problem, friends. Uh, over 10,000 people have died, uh, and uh, it's not in sight to have an end yet. However, when a protective dome can be erected over the boat to keep out the weather, then excavation should commence. Meanwhile, there's a man sleeping in this uh, building. He's an elder from the village a few uh, metres above. His name is Hassan, a, a very kindly gentleman. He sleeps with an Alsatian dog, and he calls himself the guardian of Noah's Ark. So he and his dog look after that uh, boat shape there. And as you can see, all we have is the hull of the ship plus the bottom deck with the rubble of the two top decks lying collapsed over the top of it. And we now go up behind the boat, up this way, to the top of the range, about two kilometres back and about 300 metres higher. Notice, here are the remains of a very ancient monument, believed to be at least 4,000 years old. Notice what it portrays. Here is a hammock-shaped mountain. Then there's a little hill next to it, and then there's a volcano. You'll notice a boat here with eight people in it, an older man and woman, three other men, three other women. And above it there fly two birds. I wonder if they are the two birds mentioned in the uh, biblical story. Here we have a comparison. Let's compare this with the landscape we see today. Notice the hammock-shaped mountain range here, and there it is again. There is the little hill, and there it is. Now the volcano is not in the picture, but it is over here to the right out of the picture. And what this ancient inscription is telling us is that the boat was up there one time. Today we have it here. But coming from that volcano, there is an ancient volcano lava flow. Now volcano uh, lava does turn ultimately into mud. And the mud flow carried this object, we believe, down the hill. And uh, eventually it was impaled on this rock. And uh, as it was damaged in the site and held there, the mud kept flowing down until eventually it covered over the boat. And this would explain, friends, why the Assyrians, 800 years before Christ, said that when they visited the boat, they actually had to go down into the ground. They explored three stories and some passageways. You will notice here that the rock is protruding into the side of it. It's been damaged there in the side. You see how it has penetrated the wreck? Well, there it is, pierced in the side and rejected even by many who sought for it. Now, only in Noah's Ark could the pre-flood world find any hope of survival. Most of them rejected it. And later, 
when Jesus told this planet that he had come to rescue mankind, that he was the only means to eternal life. He too was rejected by most of mankind, pierced in the side, and rejected by those who sought life. Jesus has given us a prophecy. He says that as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the days when he is to return. Now, if we are to go into the evidence which could be brought out, the Bible says that man had begun to multiply on the earth. Now, if we go back to our own history, we find that population was simply adding. It added to itself over many hundreds of years. But since about 1850, it's been multiplying. We have an exponential curve of population growth here. And I would suggest to you that the same thing was occurring in Noah's day. It says that men began to multiply upon the earth just before the flood. First there was the normal growth pattern, and then there was a sudden multiplication of population. You notice we have reached the same stage population pattern as Noah's day. There was also a very high civilization, tremendous technology, and when you consider that a, a boat contained uh, a very sophisticated alloy of iron, aluminium and titanium, it's no surprise that uh, we should be comparing Noah's day to our own day with high technology. Now, the Bible talks about Tubal Cain, for example, as being a, a man who not only used metals and smelted them, but he instructed. So there was a school of metallurgy about 300 years before the flood. Now, if we were to equate that with our Industrial Revolution about 300 years ago, uh, where could the people before the flood have reached technologically by the time the flood arrived? We certainly have come a long way in our history. Now, a third uh, comparison is corruption. The Bible says that at the time of Noah, corruption was widespread. And today, friends, is there anyone who would doubt that we have reached a similar stage in human society. The violence filled the earth. And today we do not need anyone to tell us how widespread violence is again. Now there's a prophecy in the books uh, of the Bible, it's in the second book of Peter, which says that there will come a time when people will say, where is the promise of Jesus coming? All things have continued on since the beginning. And Peter reminds us that the people of our day are going to be ignorant, willfully ignorant of past events. They're going to be ignorant of the fact that there was a great flood. And uh, they deliberately will forget this fact, Peter says, that God did destroy the world with a mighty flood long after he had made the heavens by the word of his command. And God has commanded that the earth and the heavens be stored away for a great bonfire at the judgment day when all ungodly men shall perish. Now doesn't that sound familiar? It's talking about that modern theory that's so rampant today that there has been no interruption to human history by the Creator. The modern skeptic unwittingly fulfills this prophecy. Ignoring evidence, he shouts down the great flood and Noah's ark. And I say to my skeptic friends, you should keep quiet. Then the prophecy would fail. But you're making it come true. Our world will be caught by surprise sometime in the near future. I believe the Creator has set a time to intervene and we are approaching it at breakneck speed. The Bible says that Noah's Ark contains a message for those who will live just before the second coming. The flood was an extraordinary intervention of God in history. Is it not appropriate then, friends, that the ark should be found just as Jesus is soon to return, the greatest intervention of all? I leave that thought with you.